And joining us now is House Intelligence Committee Chairman, Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio. Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for being with Thanks us. Now. As we say, breaking news all around us. Yeah. So we've clarified with Julie Sirkin and some of our other colleagues on the Hill. What's been going on is the speaker came off the floor and was cornered by several members who did not want the Ukraine vote to go forward. And there was a fairly peaceful conversation until, she reports, Wisconsin Republican Derek Van Orden got involved and got into the speaker's face and started calling him names and said that he would file a privilege motion to vacate, which would require a House floor vote within two days, not the threat from Marjorie Taylor Greene that had so far uh, and Congressman Massey. So at this point, what are your hopes of getting the Ukraine and Israel aid that I know you're passionate about Absolutely. to the House floor so right. you can have a vote? Right. Well, we have to pass this Ukraine aid. It is at a critical time. Um, the, uh, uh, the, it, because of the delay that has occurred in getting uh, this funding approved, uh, Ukraine is running out of, uh, of ammunition and inventory. And also there are additional we advanced weapon systems that they need that I believe the administration might, may soon approve that would be part of this package that would give them a real edge uh, to be able to, you know, hopefully push Russia back and, uh, you know, repel their aggression. What's interesting about the, what you just said on the House floor, I mean, we really need to, to, to change the rule that is really left over that allows for one member uh, to call for vacating the, the chair of the Speaker. The, um, the Speaker has shown incredible courage in bringing this package to the floor. Um, and what has happened, where the Speaker's position used to have power and authority, is that now you have the, these, the, the bully caucus who believes that every one of and each one of them uh, can bully or to threaten uh, the Speaker. And that needs to stop. We need to get back to professionalism. We need to get back to governing. We need to get back to legislating. And uh, this rule needs to be changed. And the, the House Rules Committee, which has to report this out, and they are the gatekeepers, and they've got some pretty hardline members. Do you think it can get out of House rules? I think there's bipartisan support for this rule change. And this type of, of, of physical bullying, uh, not just legislative bullying, is, is a great example. We need the Speaker to be free uh, from, uh, from this type of, of threat um, and so that he can do the right thing and, and serve the American people. And he's certainly showing a tremendous amount of courage. And what about the fact that President Trump, former President Trump, has been you know, very negative about the Ukraine aid wants it to be alone. There can be some arguments for that. But they've been arguing for it to be done through the repo of taking Russian assets. But there's only $3 billion under U.S. control in Russian assets. The G7 is meeting right now, the foreign ministers, and they're talking about doing that in June or addressing it in June. But most of that Russian money is frozen and is, for some reason, beyond my ken. It's, it's in Belgium, and there's more of it in, in uh, Japan. It's not the $61 billion that is going to provide the, the particular weapons that you just said are so important to Ukraine right now, air right. defenses that we can provide. You're absolutely right. Uh, and, and we're seeing every day uh, that Ukrainians are dying because of uh, Russian shelling uh, and the, the need for air defense in, in Ukraine. And, and as you are aware, you know, a good chunk of this money goes to replenish U.S. stocks. Um, it, if you actually break down the portion that Ukraine is getting, it's not uh, it, the uh, it's a smaller portion overall of the uh, amount of money that's being approved. And even so, the United States has contributed less than half of all aid, military and humanitarian uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we need to step up the plate. It's part of the morale that Ukraine needs. We need to stand up to Putin. Putin needs to know that the United States is not going to walk away. Uh, this is a fight between authoritarianism and democracy, and we need to be on the side of democracy. And another thing Mr. Trump said, I think on Friday, was that the U.S. should not do anything until Europe does something. Well, Europe did $54 billion this year already. Right. Again, we're, we're less than half. It's not that they're half. doing anything. <laughs> yeah, we're less than half of overall aid. The EU uh, collective nations have contributed more overall than the United States has overall. I want to ask you about what you said uh, in the last couple of days or a week ago, perhaps, about how some of the House Republicans, wittingly or not, are repeating Russian propaganda against Ukraine, false charges against uh, so-called corruption in Ukraine and other things that are completely unproved. But it's coming right from the Russia propaganda machine, and it's ending up on the, the House floor. And what can you as the intelligence chair or your colleagues do about that? Right. So we're trying to get into the hands of, of you know, our fellow members of Congress information that they could understand what real threat Russia is. I mean, it's, it's also pro-Russian propaganda uh, that, uh, you know, 
we, we need to be able to clearly identify Russia's an adversary. Their weapons are pointed at us. They continue to field new weapon systems, including new nuclear weapon systems. And they continue to hack into the United States. Um, we continue to see you know, threats to our infrastructure as a result of, of Russians' nefarious actions. And we need to be able to stand up and clearly say Russia is an adversary. We're not going to allow them as an aggressor uh, to, uh, to continue to, to kill and threaten um, a, a standing democracy in, in Europe that will, if, if they were permitted, cascade and threaten other nations in Europe. And when we met last in February in Munich at the security conference, that weekend, President Zelensky was saying, we could lose this war. We could have to keep retreating. Advika was lost that weekend. Sorry. Navalny was killed that Friday of that weekend when we were there in Sorry. Munich. So, so many events were happening. And it was a very downbeat meeting of, of the European leaders and, and of the U.S. Right now, it, it's gotten a lot worse. Her son has been attacked. There have been continued retreats. They really are in trouble. They are. And, and this is winnable by them. And, and two things need to happen to, for the shift. One, they need our aid so that they have sufficient weapon stocks to be able to defend themselves and to fight. And they're the ones who are doing the fighting, and, and admirably and honorably. And then secondly, um, they need long-range weapon systems. Uh, they need to be able to um, hold Crimea at risk and uh, the Russian supply lines and push back so the so-called attack lines, The, the 300-kilometer uh, attack is long range. Uh, as they're being attacked uh, with, um, with, with drones and missiles from Crimea, they need to be able to take out those weapon systems to keep their own people safe. I want to ask you about Israel because Israel's war cabinet is reportedly divided over how strongly to retaliate. They've agreed they want to strike back at Iran. But they're divided over the whether, I presume, they go to territorial or they could do other things. They could do cyber. They could go to proxies. What, what do you think about that and the, the risk of a wider war if it becomes tit for tat? Well, I think at this point, Iran already has escalated this. They have taken right. uh, unprecedentedly an, an attack uh, to Israel from Iranian soil, uh, an overwhelming use of force, 300 missiles and drones uh, that were lobbed at, at Israel. Now, unfortunately, this administration has taken the position that if missile defense is used and we take those down, uh, that, uh, that the this lessens somehow the uh, the attack itself. This attack was was um, intended to, to kill people in, a, in Israel. It was an overwhelming use of force that came directly from Iran. It needs to be viewed as such. What, do you think Israel should hit territorial Iran, or can, are there other ways to do it to try to not bring this? directly to Tehran. Right. Well, I think there are a number of things that they, they need to do, but it, Iran itself does need to be to feel the consequences. And and they haven't even felt the consequences as a result of the proxies that they have trained and funded and given weapons to. You know, Hamas and the attack on October 7th, uh, they are absolutely a proxy of Iran. Hezbollah, the same thing. The Houthis in Yemen who are attacking our commercial shipways. All of this is being orchestrated, funded, trained, and equipped by Iran itself. And they so far have not had uh, any consequence. The fact that they have entered into this conflict and are attacking Israel directly, um, they, they need to understand that there are consequences for that. But I'll leave it to the Israelis to decide what, what you know, of the smorgasbord of options that they have, which they choose. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Hey everyone, MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.